The great thing about the Iliad is that it is, the Iliad is not an anti-war poem, it is a war poem. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, it presents the dual, it, it presents both the horror of war and also the kind of staggering, attractive beauty of it and, and the brotherhood that's, that's part of it. And that, we call it an Iliad because it's, for us, it's not the Iliad. Uh, it's only one view and in a way it's sort of really more about Homer than it is about the whole Iliad. Everything is is to reach the audience's ears and hearts, to make them complicit in the tale. They cannot escape by being a passive viewer. They are implied. So we at one point list the ships. You know, Homer lists the, the role of ships, and it goes on for 13 pages, and it says, first came the Boeotian units led by Pelagia. It's this long list of these names, and our poet stops himself and says, that's right, you don't know these people. Well, it's as if they came from, and he begins to name towns in America. He begins to name places in America, so that the audience isn't metaphorizing. They're not saying, oh, it's like that. They're going, I have a son. You know, my, I'm, from, I'm from Iowa. I'm, I'm from Florida. So no, they, they can no longer escape the impact of the story. They are in the story. And so when we have our contemporary riffs, they're not a gimmick. They're not, they're not an attempt to make a dumb audience understand a tough old tale. There are ways of making that audience breathe and smell exactly what this is in their own terms. They cannot escape it. They become part of it. Um, and it's incredibly effective. And we didn't know it would be effective until we began to put it on its feet. And uh, it, it forces people to be in the experience. And that, that's tantamount for us. It, it, was, it was one of our driving motivations to be in a bar to go to a military base, to stop people on the street corner to tell the story, that they are, you are being told the story. You are here, it's about you. And that's really important for us. We thought it has to feel, we, I didn't, I was not interested in doing something that felt at all um, uh, purely academic or purely old, <laughs> ancient. So we were thinking about trying to find a way to also have this be very modern, where an actor might tell the story now if he didn't have at his disposal the things. If he knew the story of the Trojan War intimately, but he walked into a bar and he said, gather around everybody, who wants to hear it? Do you want to hear a war story? Let me tell you a story about it. And he would speak in the way we speak now. He, he uh, is a spirit who is a, whose, whose curse it is to uh, watch, to be in the middle of, to understand, to learn, to remember the story of the Trojan War, to carry it with him through the centuries, to tell it uh, uh, whenever the world feels like it needs to be reminded about the Trojan War. So he started to become this kind of like ancient mariner for us who is has this burden or challenge each night he performs it, which is that if he could only remember it perfectly, if only he could tell it just right, human nature would change and all war would cease. The reason why it's so important that we finally came to this decision that is in a room is that Homer is talking to that audience. He's talking to the people in front of him, not an imagined audience, not an idealized audience. He's talking to the people in the room, literally, in Princeton, New Jersey. He's talking to them. He was brought to this room for this evening. He's very aware of where he is. He's very aware of them. On the one hand, it is about storytelling. It's about theater, really, and how we communicate stories to one another. And, uh, and on the other hand, of course, this is um, a war story. And, uh, and really what, what, what I've been interested in is how those two very powerful streams of interest collide in this one piece.